Okay. Give me a moment. Don't go away. Oh, come on. Go away. All right. Okay. Oh, God, shut up about the frame rate. I don't know how to do anything about it. Stop it. Sorry. Um, anyway, hello, good evening, good morning, good whatever it is for you where you are. For me, it's nighttime. Um, so uh, I am going to, well, oh, hi. First of all, I'm Tad for the anybody who might be showing up who isn't already familiar with that fact. Um, and I'm going to be starting a new book tonight. Um, before I do anything particularly interesting, I want to tell you about, no, we just, we've done more birthday stuff, I think, since the last time we spoke. Um, and uh, yeah, we have, because we had a birthday on Monday. So we've been living the high life, uh, birthday dinners and such, and um, things that go with that, birthdaying in general. No new Mylar balloons, though. So the same old Mylar balloons are still... Uh, Deborah had sacrificed the uh, the mylar balloons this time um, for our poor large dog who regards them uh, in much the same way that uh, Italian people uh, register the malocchio. You know? <laughs> it's like the evil eye, the evil mylar balloons. They terrify him. So um, no balloons this time. Anyway, what else was I going to tell you? So, oh, well, anyway, so tonight I am starting a new book. And although I think it was pretty obvious, actually, from the, all the votes that came in, so nobody should be too shocked that it is Otherland. What uh, people might be shocked by is the, the horror of this. This picture is this is before I had children. See what this does to you having children. Um, but anyway, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to start City of Gold and Shadow tonight. Again, as with the um, first book of whatever other series I've read, first Shadow March, first um, Ordinary Farm, there is no guarantee there will be more after that, uh, especially with Otherland. Otherland is bloody long. For various complicated reasons, I just had to do a bunch of rereading in Otherland and went, wow, that is, that is a, uh, an ambitious <laughs> set of books. <laughs> Um, it, it's been interesting, I have to say, going back to it. I literally, I, I did some spot checking some years back when I was writing some stories, um, which I think I've read them, most of them to you. Um, one of them is actually not something that I'm permitted to read for various complicated reasons I won't bore you with, but I read to you the two Orlando stories I could read. But other than those, you know, kind of selective trolling through um, mostly the first and second book, um, I actually haven't read them for, uh, you know, as, as a whole since they were written, which is, you know, 25 years ago now. Yeah, it has to be at least 25 years, I think. And because of that, um, it's all kind of interesting and revelatory to me. It won't be so much an issue in this first 
bit I'm going to read because of I think how far we're going to get tonight. Um, but uh, I realized as I was rereading them, I'm going to have to do a lot of South African and Australian accents. So <laughs> I hope you'll bear with me. Those of you who actually speak Aussie or speak South African, um, and I hope you will bear with me. Um, I will do my best not to be too offensively bad, um, but I can't guarantee anything. You know, it's it's. You know, I'll 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 give it my best shot. Anything else I wanted to talk about? Um, no, except I'm still very proud of these books, and I think in some ways, and I know most people out there are more emotionally attached to my um, Ostinard books for whatever reasons. And some people obviously have a very strong attachment to Tail Chaser because they like animal books. And some people may have discovered my work with later works and that's where their fondness lies. But I think for me personally, um, I think the Otherland books, if not the most emotionally rewarding or whatever, I mean, you know, I, I think in many ways for me are the best expression of myself as a writer, the fullest expression, covers the most ground, has humor and horror and um, extremely intricate plots um, that, that all pay off in some shape or form, um, zillions of characters and a lot of ideas, a lot of philosophy, a lot of uh, satire and parody of the modern world and all kinds of things going on. So I'm still very proud of these books and rereading them didn't make me any less so, which was a good thing. Um, so that's the basic facts. So before I start, of course, we'll check in and see who has who has come into the Tadnasium tonight, for lack of a better word. So let me see who we've got. We've got Lalani. Hello, Lalani, and good morning to England. Oh, sunny Sunday. I'm very glad to hear it. Jeremy, hello. Yes, Wicked Tribe, Ruling Tribe. Oh, yeah, that's right. I forgot. I it, As a honoring the other land night tonight, I am wearing my Wicked Tribe t-shirt. I was going to wear my um, confident, cocky, lazy, dead uh, T-shirt, which won't make much sense to any of you. And of course, neither will the Wicked Tribe if you don't know the story. Uh, at least this, not, not early in the story, but later on will become very meaningful, I think, even in the first volume. Yeah, in the first volume. Anyway, so yes, so I'm wearing my Wicked Tribe T-shirt because my son has absconded with my confident, cocky, lazy, dead T-shirt. And even so, I might have worn it, but I think he wore it for like two or three days in a row. <laughs> God. So until I can get, you know, the hazmat crew in to deal with it. No confident cocky t-shirt for me. Anyway, so uh, James. Hello, James. Good to see you. Is that both of those for you? The, the Hey Tad Enjoying Brothers of the Wind and the Can't Wait to Pick Your Brains? I'm always willing to have my brains picked, so please feel free. I write these books deliberately with several layers of stuff going on and things that people won't always see the first time around so that they benefit from rereading. And of course, Ostinard now has a pretty vast history of its own. Um, so there's all kinds of things, and that's one of the reasons that I rely on some of my reader friends to uh, help me out because it's got so many levels and so much history that's accumulated through the now, well, I'm almost done with that last volume. So that's God, eight, nine, 10 books, 11, counting the long short story, um, the, uh, the Burning Man. That's a lot of material, you know, several million words worth. So, or at least 2 million plus. Anyway, so thank you. Um, and I please feel free to pick my brains whensoever. It seems like a good idea. Okay, wait. Now, hang on. All the... Oh, I see. They're going up and down. Oh, God, help me. Okay. Um, this... I, I hate this. I hate Facebook so badly. I, I said it already once to um, put the comments in any kind of order. Um, I set it the way you're supposed to set it, and then, of course, it has never kept it the way I want it to be. Um, and it says comment settings, but I can't change the comment settings. So it's just now, the comments that I was responding to have now just all disappeared, as if I had gotten rid of them, which I did nothing of the sort. 
Anyway, so if I miss your name, please forgive me. This thing is so messed up. Anyway, so, and yeah, because here, here's Ronnie. Hello, Ronnie. And Ronnie is saying, oh, and Amazon has lost my copy of Brothers of the Wind. But the O and Amazon is obviously replying either to something Ronnie said earlier or someone else said, and yet that's just gone. So, I, God, I, you know, while I was looking at them, go figure. Anyway, Iris, good to see you. Um, and Wouter, hello, Wouter, and Anamika, and good to see you too, and you are very welcome. And f calling from Appeldoorn. Oh yeah, okay, very cool. I, I miss the Netherlands. I haven't seen the Netherlands for, oh, since about 2017, 2018. Um, but I always have a good time there. Wouter, hello. And Holger, hello to you. Hazel, good morning, my dear mother-in-law. Good to see you. I hope you're doing well. Um, I've already explained to most people here who you are, Hazel, so I don't have to do it again. But for anybody who doesn't know, that's my mother-in-law. That's Deb's mom. And so she is responsible in a very large way for the wonder, the glory, the terror that is Deborah Beale. Anyway, uh, Chris, good to see you. Thank you. And Mahmoud, hello. And James, yes. Um, well, I'm not sure about it. James is asking if that other land rereading means that the Book of Orlando might be coming. Book of Orlando is definitely a possibility because I've got a story idea. What I'm working on now is trying to, of course, finishing what I'm doing, but also um, hoping to, you know, then have a chance to think about what I want to work on next. I am kind of inclined to do something before I do any more Ostinard. Christine. Hello, Christina. Um, paperback version of Brothers of the Wind. I have no idea. There's a, is there a problem with Amazon? I'm going to have to check. Um, John, thank you very much. That's a very kind thing to say. I, I, as I said, I'm very fond of other land. Um, Ron, yeah. <laughs> Fortunately, there won't be much in the way of accents in the first part. But yeah, there's going to be many accents to come. Felicity, hello. Yes, I know. Unfortunately, those t-shirts are no longer available. We, we did a, a, a merchandising campaign, which Deb ran. And I'm 99.9% .9 sure that we got we used everything, that we sold everything. Um, and But what a good idea would be is if you get a chance, drop by Deb's Facebook page or her um, Twitter account and say, could you do more merchandise, please? Because I know there are certain things that I think would be fun. So anyway, Susan. Susan, good to see you. Hello. Why are those jumping up and down? Good to see you, Susan. Hi. And Mark. Good to see you too. Lisa, hello, my dear. And that's my sister-in-law. That's the younger of Lisa's two sisters. That's another odd and interesting thing about Deb and I, which is that we are both the oldest children. I am the oldest of three boys and she is the oldest of three girls. And fortunately, I am extremely fond of my sisters-in-law and Deb is extremely fond of my brothers-in-law. So, or her brothers-in-law, sorry, my brothers, her brothers-in-law. So that all works out well. We're very lucky that way. And um, I'm very fond of my mother-in-law too, as I hope I made clear. Kristen, hello, good to see you. And I think I've got everybody here. At least I've got all the ones they left to me because as I mentioned, they just obliterated the others as I was, they're disappearing as I go. That's weird because now the, the, the comments start like, oh God. I already said this once. Sorry to be complaining about this stuff, but it's just absolutely maddening how you do everything that they tell you to do and then they still screw it up anyway. Okay, that's enough. Enough of that. Enough complaining. Enough dealing with the crap factory that is <laughs> these live broadcasts and the confusingness of them. Um, as I said, I have set everything as best I can. There's nothing else I can do about it now. So I'm just going to go ahead and start reading. Okay, um, and as I do that, well, I'll let you know if we're going to go past the first chapter, uh, or rather, not even the chapter, but the, the prologue, the foreword, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, foreword. Um, before I do, <coughs> I would like to read a brief author's note. This is not because I want to um, glorify my own words or anything. No, rather the opposite. In fact, what I want to talk about is a group of people who uh, play a major part in this. They're, 
their culture is represented in this book. And so even when I was writing this, I was very conscious of the fact that I was writing about someone else's culture that was not mine. And not only that, but it was a culture that a lot of people didn't know about. So therefore, you know, as a quote unquote, you know, semi well-known writer, I was going to be some people's first experience with the Bushmen of Southern Africa. So anyway, so here's the author's note and then we'll start the story. The Aboriginal people of Southern Africa are known by many names, San, Basarwa, remote area, remote area dwellers in current government speak, and more commonly, Bushmen. Oh, by the way, this is 1996 when this book came out. So this was written somewhere like in 94 or 95. Um, I'll give you a quick update on the end. Um, I freely admit that I have taken great liberties in my portrayal of Bushman life and beliefs in this novel. The Bushmen do not have a monolithic folklore. Each area and sometimes each extended family can sustain its own quite vibrant myths or a single culture. I have simplified and sometimes transposed Bushman thoughts and songs and stories. Fiction has its own demands. but. The Bushmen's old ways are indeed disappearing fast. One of my most dubious bits of truth manipulation may turn out to be the simple assertion that there will be anyone left pursuing the hunter-gatherer life in the bush by the middle of the 21st century, which is roughly when this takes place. But the Bushmen's old ways are indeed disappearing fast. One of my most dubious... Oh, sorry, I already read that. Um, however, However I have trimmed the truth, I have done my best to make the spirit of my portrayal accurate. If I have offended or exploited, I have failed. My intent is primarily to tell a story, but if the story leads some readers to learn more about the Bushmen and about a way of life that none of us can afford to ignore, I will be very happy. Um, brief update on that, which is um, things are there has been a great deal of things happening. The Bushmen, uh, many of the Bushmen of uh, the Kalahari have actually were moved by the government of Botswana out of their tribal lands, their hunter-gatherer lands where they lived their nomadic lifestyle. Um, some of them got to go back, but the government of Botswana has been very unwilling. Um, there are still a lot of issues, but there are still a few Bushmen, I am glad to say, leading the original hunter-gatherer life as of this point. Uh, again, it is a lifestyle that is very much imperiled, uh, mostly by other humans, um, and and you know the the changing nature of what we do to environments around us and what that does to the people and animals that live on those environments. So anyway, all right. That aside, it is now time to read. Otherland, Volume 1, City of Golden Shadow. Forward. It started in mud, as many things do. In a normal world, it would have been time for breakfast. But apparently, breakfast was not served in hell. The bombardment that had begun before dawn showed no signs of letting up. Private Jonas did not feel much like eating, anyway. Except for a brief moment of terrified retreat across a patch of muddy ground cratered and desolate as the moon, Paul Jonas had spent all of this 24th day of March, 1918, as he had spent the three days before and most of the past several months, crouched, shivering in cold, stinking slime, somewhere between Ypres and Saint-Quentin, deafened by the skull-rattling thunder of the German heavy guns, praying reflectively to something in which he no longer believed. He had lost Finch and Mullet and the rest of the platoon, somewhere in the chaos of retreat. He hoped they'd made it safely into some other part of the trenches, but it was hard to think about anything much beyond his own few cubits of misery. The entire world was wet and sticky. The torn earth, the skeletal trees, and Paul himself had all been abundantly spattered by the slow-falling slow mist that followed hundreds of pounds of red-hot metal exploding in a crowd of human beings. Red fog, gray earth, sky the color of old bones. Paul Jonas was in hell. 
but it was a very special hell. Not everyone in it was dead yet. In fact, Paul noted, one of its residents was dying very slowly indeed. By the sound of the man's voice, he could not be more than two dozen yards away, but he might as well have been in Timbuktu. Paul had no idea what the wounded soldier looked like. He could no more have voluntarily lifted his head above the lip of the trench than he could have willed himself to fly. But he was all too familiar with the man's voice, which had been cursing, sobbing, and squealing in agony for a full hour, filling every lull between the crash of the guns. All the rest of the men who had been hit during the retreat had shown the good manners to die quickly, or at least to suffer quietly. Paul's invisible companion had screamed for his sergeant, his mother, and God, and when none of them had come for him, had kept on screaming anyway. He was screaming still, a sobbing, wordless wail. Once a faceless doughboy like thousands of others, the wounded man now seemed determined to make everyone on the Western Front bear witness to his dying moments. Paul hated him. The terrible thumping roar subsided. There was a glorious moment of silence before the wounded man began to shriek again, piping like a boiling lobster. Got a light? Paul turned. Pale, beer-yellow eyes peered from a mask of mud beside him. The apparition crouched on hands and knees, wore a greatcoat so tattered it seemed made from cobwebs. What? Got a light? A match? The normality of the question in the midst of so much that was unreal left Paul wondering if he had heard correctly. The figure lifted a hand as muddy as the face, displaying a thin white cylinder so luminously clean that it might have dropped from the moon. Can you hear, fella? A light! Paul reached into his pocket and fumbled with numbed fingers until he found a box of matches, miraculously dry. The wounded soldier began howling even louder, lost in the wilderness a stone's throw away. The man in the ragged greatcoat tipped himself against the side of the trench, fitting the curve of his back into the sheltering mud, then delicately pulled the cigarette into two pieces and handed one to Paul. As he lit the match, he tilted his head to listen. God help me, he's still going on up there. He passed the matches back and held the flame steady so Paul could light his own cigarette. Why couldn't Fritz drop one on him? Give us all a little peace. Paul nodded his head. Even that was an effort. His companion lifted his chin and let out a dribble of smoke which curled up past the rim of his helmet and vanished against the flat morning sky. Did you ever get the feeling? Feeling? That it's a mistake? The stranger wagged his head to indicate the trenches, the German guns, all of the Western Front. That God's away or having a bit of a sleep or something. Don't you find yourself hoping that one day he'll look down and see what's happening and, and do something about it? Paul nodded, although he had never thought the matter through in such detail. But he had felt the emptiness of the gray skies and had occasionally had a curious sensation of looking down on the blood and mud from a great distance, observing the murderous deeds of war with the detachment of a man standing over an anthill. God could not be watching, that was certain. If he was, and if he had seen the things Paul Jonas had seen, men who were dead but didn't know it, frantically trying to push their spilled guts back into their blouses, Bodies swollen and fly-blown, lying unretrieved for days within yards of friends with whom they had sung and laughed. If he had seen all that but not interfered, then he must be insane. But Paul had never for a moment believed that God would save the tiny creatures slaughtering each other by the thousands over an acre of shell-pocked mud. That was too much like a fairy tale. Beggar boys did not marry princesses. They died in snowy streets or dark alleys, or in muddy trenches in France while old Papa God took a long rest. 
he summoned up his strength. Heard anything? The stranger drew deeply on his cigarette, unconcerned that the ember was burning against his muddy fingers, and sighed. Everything? Nothing? You know, Fritz is breaking through in the south, and he'll go right on to Paris, or, oh, or now the Yanks are in it, we're going to roll them right up and march to Berlin by June. The winged victory of Samo Watsit appeared in the skies over Flanders, waving a flaming sword and dancing the hoochie coo. It's all shit. It's all shit, Paul agreed. He drew once more on his own cigarette and then dropped it into a puddle. He watched sadly as muddy water wicked into the paper and the last fragments of tobacco floated free. How many more cigarettes would he smoke before death found him? A dozen? A hundred? Or might that one be his last? He picked up the paper and squeezed it into a tight ball between his finger and thumb. Thanks, mate. The stranger rolled over and began crawling away up the trench, then shouted something odd over his shoulder. Keep your head down. Try to think about getting out. About really getting out. Paul lifted his hand in a farewell wave, although the man could not see him. The wounded soldier topside was shouting again, wordless, grunting cries that sounded like something inhuman giving birth. Within moments, as though wakened by demonic invocation, the guns started up again. Paul clenched his teeth and tried to stop up his ears with his hands, but he could still hear the man screaming. The rasping voice was like a hot wire going in one ear hole and out the other, sawing back and forth. He had snatched perhaps three hours of sleep in the last two days, and the night fast approaching seemed sure to be even worse. Why hadn't any of the stretcher teams gone out to bring back the wounded man? The guns had been silent for at least an hour. But as he thought about it, Paul realized that, except for the man who had come begging a light, he had not seen anyone else since they had all fled the forward trenches that morning. He had assumed that there were others just a few bends down, and the man with the cigarette had seemed to confirm that, but the bombardment had been so steady that Paul had felt no desire to move. Now that things had been quiet a while, he was beginning to wonder what was happening to the rest of the platoon. Had Finch and all the rest all fallen back to an earlier series of scrapes, or were they just a few yards down the line, hugging the depths, unwilling to face the open killing ground even on a mission of mercy? He slid forward onto his knees and tipped his helmet back so it would not slide over his eyes, then began to crawl westward. Even well below the top of the trench, he felt his own movement to be a provocative act. He hunched his shoulders in expectation of some terrible blow from above, yet nothing came down on him but the ceaseless wail of the dying man. Twenty yards and two bends later, he reached a wall of mud. Paul tried to wipe away the tears, but only succeeded in pushing dirt into his eyes. A last explosion echoed above, and the ground shook in sympathy. A gob of mud on one of the roots protruding into the trench quivered, fell, and became an indistinguishable part of the greater muddiness below. He was trapped. That was the simple, horrible fact. Unless he braved the unprotected ground above, he could only huddle in his sealed-off section of trench until a shell found him. He had no illusion that he would last long enough for starvation to become a factor. He had no illusions at all. He was as good as dead. He would never again listen to Mullet complaining about rations or watch old Finch trimming his mustache with a pocket knife. Such small things, so homely, but he already missed them so badly that it hurt. The dying man was still out there, still howling. This is hell, nor am I out of it. What was that from, a poem? the Bible? He unsnapped his holster and drew his pistol, then lifted it toward his eye. In the failing light, the hole in its barrel seemed deep as a well, 
an emptiness into which he could fall and never come out, a silent, dark, restful emptiness. Paul smiled a bleak little smile, then carefully laid the pistol in his lap. It would be unpatriotic, surely. Better to force the Germans to use up their expensive shells on him, squeeze a few more working hours out of some model-armed Fräulein on a factory line in the Ruhr Valley. Besides, there was always hope, wasn't there? He began weeping once more. Above, the wounded man stopped screeching for a moment to cough. He sounded like a dog being whipped. Paul leaned his head back against the mud and bellowed, Shut it! Shut it! For Christ's sake! He took a deep breath. Shut your mouth and die, damn you! Apparently encouraged by companionship, the man resumed screaming. Night seemed to last a year or more. Months of darkness, great blocks of immovable black. The guns sputtered and shouted. The dying man wailed. Paul counted every single individual object he could remember from his life before the trenches, then started over and counted them again. He remembered only the names of some of them, but not what the names actually meant. Some words seemed impossibly strange. Lawn chair was one, bathtub another. Garden was mentioned in several songs in the chaplain's hymn book, but Paul was fairly certain it was a real thing as well, so he counted it. Try to think about getting out, the yellow-eyed man had said. About really getting out. The guns were silent. The sky had gone a slightly paler shade, as though someone had wiped it with a dirty rag. There was just enough light for Paul to see the edge of the trench. He clambered up and then slid back, laughing silently at the up and down of it all. Getting out. He found a thick root with his foot and heaved himself onto the rim of the earthwork. He had his gun. He was going to kill the man who was screaming. He didn't know much more than that. Somewhere the sun was coming up, although Paul had no idea where exactly that might be happening. The effect was small and smeared across a great dull expanse of sky. Beneath that sky, everything was gray. Mud and water. He knew the water was the flat places, so everything else was mud, except for the tall things. Yes, those were trees, he remembered. Had been trees. Paul stood up and turned in a slow circle. The world extended for only a few hundred yards in any direction before ending in mist. He was marooned in the center of an empty space, as though he had wandered onto a stage by mistake and now stood before a silent, expectant audience. But he was not entirely alone. Halfway across the emptiness, one tree stood by itself, a clawing hand with a twisted bracelet of barbed wire. Something dark hung in its denuded branches. Paul drew his revolver and staggered toward it. It was a figure, hanging upside down like a discarded marionette, one leg caught in the high angle of bow and trunk. All its joints seemed to have been broken, and the arms dangled downward, fingers reaching, as though muck were heaven, and it was struggling to fly. The front of its head was a tattered, featureless mass of red and scorched black and gray, except for one bright, staring yellow eye, mad and intent as a bird's eye, which watched his slow approach. "'I got out,' Paul said. He lifted his gun, but the man was not screaming now. A hole opened in the ruined face. It spoke. You've come at last. I've been waiting for you. Paul stared. The butt of the gun was slippery in his fingers. His arms trembled with the effort of keeping it raised. Waiting? Waiting. Waiting so long. The mouth empty but for a few white shards floating in red, twisted in an upside-down smile. 
Do you ever get the feeling? Paul winced as the screaming began again, but it could not be the dying man. This was the dying man, so... Feeling? he asked, then looked up. The dark shape was tumbling down the sky toward him, a black hole in the dull gray air, whistling as it came. The dull thump of the howitzer followed a moment later, as though time had turned and bitten its own tail. That it's a mistake, said the hanging man. And then the shell struck, and the world folded in on itself, smaller and smaller, angle after angle, creased with fire and then compressed along its axes until it all vanished. Things became even more complicated after Paul died. He was dead, of course, and he knew it. How could he be anything else? He had seen the howitzer shell diving down on him from the sky, a wingless, eyeless, breathtakingly modern angel of death, streamlined and impersonal as a shark. He had felt the world convulse and the air catch fire, felt his lungs raped of oxygen and charred to cracklings in his chest. There could be no doubt that he was dead. But why did his head hurt? Of course, uh, an afterlife in which the punishment for a misspent existence was an eternally throbbing headache might make a sort of sense, a horrible sort of sense. Paul opened his eyes and blinked at the light. He was sitting upright on the rim of a vast crater, a surely mortal wound ripped deep into the muddy earth. The land around it was flat and empty. There were no trenches, or if there were, they were buried under the outflingings of the explosion. He could see nothing but churned mud in any direction until the earth itself blurred into gray gleaming mist along the encircling horizon. But something solid was behind him, propping him up, and the sensation of it against the small of his back and his shoulder blades made him wonder for the first time whether he had anticipated death too soon. As he tilted his head back to look, his helmet brim tipped forward over his eyes, returning him to darkness for a moment, then slid down over his face and onto his lap. He stared at the helmet. Most of its crown was gone, blasted away. The torn and tortured metal of the brim resembled nothing so much as a crown of thorns. Remembering horror tales of shell-blasted soldiers who walked two dozen yards without their heads or held their own innards in their hands without recognizing what they were, Paul shivered convulsively. Slowly, as though playing a grisly game with himself, he ran his fingers up his face, past his cheeks and temples, feeling for what must be the pulped top of his own skull. He touched hair, skin, and bone, but all in their proper places. No wound. When he held his hands before his face, they were striped with as much blood as mud, but the red was dry already, old paint and powder. He let out a long-held breath. He was dead, but his head hurt. He was alive, but a red-hot shell fragment had ripped through his helmet like a knife through cake frosting. Paul looked up then and saw the tree, the small skeletal thing that had drawn him across no man's land, the tree where the dying man had hung. Now it stretched up through the clouds. Paul Jonas sighed. He had walked around the tree five times and it showed no sign of becoming any less impossible. The frail, leafless thing had grown so large that its top was out of sight beyond the clouds that hung motionless in the gray sky. Its trunk was as wide as a castle tower from a fairy story, a massive cylinder of rough bark that seemed to extend as far downward as it did up, running smoothly down the side of the bomb crater, vanishing into the soil at the bottom with no trace of roots. He had walked around the tree, and could make no sense of it. 
He had walked away from the tree, hoping to find an angle from which he could gauge its height, but that had not assisted his understanding either. No matter how far he stumbled back across the featureless plain, the tree still stretched beyond the cloud ceiling. And always, whether he wanted to or not, he found himself returning to the tree again. Not only was there nothing else to move toward, but the world itself seemed somehow curved, so that no matter which direction he took, eventually he found himself heading back toward the monumental trunk. He sat with his back against it for a while and tried to sleep. Sleep would not come, but stubbornly he kept his eyes closed anyway. He was not happy with the puzzles set before him. He had been struck by an exploding shell. The war and everyone in it seemed to have vanished, although a conflict of that size should have been a rather difficult thing to misplace. The light had not changed in this place since he had come here, although it must have been hours since the explosion. And the only other thing in the world was an immense, impossible vegetable. He prayed that when he opened his eyes again, he would either find himself in some sort of respectable afterlife or return to the familiar misery of the trenches with Mullet and Finch and the rest of the platoon. When the prayer had ended, he still did not risk a look, determined to give God or whoever enough time to put things right. He sat doing his best to ignore the band of pain across the back of his head, letting the silence seep into him as he waited for normality to reassert itself. At last he opened his eyes. Mist, mud, and that immense damnable tree. Nothing had changed. Paul sighed deeply and stood up. He did not remember much about his life before the war, and at this moment even the immediate past was dim, but he did remember that there had been a certain kind of story in which an impossible thing happened, and once that impossible thing had proved that it was not going to unhappen again, there was only one course of action left. The impossible thing must be treated as a possible thing. What did you do with an unavoidable tree that grew up into the sky beyond the clouds? You climbed it. It was not as difficult as he had expected. Although no branches jutted from the trunk until just below the belly of the clouds, the very size of the tree helped him. The bark was pitted and cracked like the skin of some immense serpent, providing excellent toeholds and handholds. Some of the bumps were big enough to sit on, allowing him to catch his breath in relative safety and comfort. But still it was not easy. Although it was hard to tell in that timeless, sunless place, he felt he had been climbing for at least half a day when he reached the first branch. It was as broad as a country road, bending up and away. Where it too vanished into the clouds, he could see the first faint shapes of leaves. Paul lay down where the branch met the trunk and tried to sleep, but though he was very tired, sleep still would not come. When he had rested for a while, he got up and resumed climbing. After a while, the air grew cooler, and he began to feel the wet touch of clouds. The sky around the great tree was becoming murkier, the ends of the branches obscured. He could see vast, shadowy shapes hanging in the distant foliage overhead, but he could not identify them. Another half-hour's climbing revealed them to be monstrous apples, each as large as a barrage balloon. As he mounted higher, the fog thickened until he was surrounded by a phantom world of branches and drifting tattered clouds as though he clambered in the rigging of a ghost ship. No sound reached him but the creaking and scratching of bark beneath his feet. Breezes blew, cooling the thin sweat on his forehead, and none of them blew hard enough to shake, but none of them blew hard enough to shake the great flat leaves. Silence and shreds of mist. The great trunk and its mantle of branches above and below him, a world in itself. Paul climbed on. The clouds began to grow even more dense, and he could sense the light changing. Something warm was making the mists glow like a lantern behind thick curtains. 
He rested again and wondered how long it would take him to fall if he were to step off the branch on which he sat. He plucked a loose button from his shirt cuff and let it drop, watching it shiver down the air currents until it vanished silently into the clouds below. Later, he had no idea how much later, he found himself climbing into glow growing radiance. The gray bark began to show traces of other colors, sandy beiges and pale yellows. The upper surfaces of the branches seemed flattened by the new harsher light, and the surrounding mist gleamed and sparkled as though tiny rainbows played between the individual drops. The cloud mist was so thick here that it impeded his climb, curling around his face in dripping tendrils, lubricating his grip weighting his clothes and dragging him treacherously as he negotiated difficult hand-to-hand -hand changeovers. He briefly considered giving up, but there was nowhere else for him to go except back down. It seemed worth risking an unpleasantly swift descent to avoid the slower alternative which could lean only to eternal nothingness on that gray plain. In any case, Paul thought, if he was already dead, he couldn't die again. If he was alive, then he was part of a fairy tale, and surely no one ever died this early in the story. The clouds grew thicker. The last hundred yards of his ascent he might have been climbing through rotting muslin. The damp resistance kept him from noticing how bright the world was becoming, but as he pushed through the last clouds and lifted his head blinking, it was to find himself beneath a dazzling, brassy sun and a sky of pure, unclouded blue. No clouds above, but clouds everywhere else. The top of the great frothy mass through which he had just climbed stretched away before him like a white meadow, a miles-wide, hummocked plain of cloud stuff, and in the distance, shimmering in the brilliant sunlight, a castle. As Paul stared, the pale, slender towers seemed to stretch and waver like something seen through the waters of a mountain lake. Still, it was clearly a castle, not just an illusion compounded of clouds and sun. Colorful pennants danced from the tops of the, ch of the sharp turrets, and the huge porticullist gate was a grinning mouth opening into darkness. He laughed, suddenly and abruptly, but his eyes filled with tears. It was beautiful. It was terrifying. After the great gray emptiness and the half-world of the clouds, it was too bright, too strong, almost too real. Still, it was what he had been climbing toward. It called to him as clearly as if it had possessed a voice, just as the dim awareness of an inescapable something awaiting him had summoned him to climb the tree. There was the faintest suggestion of a path across the spun sugar plain, a more solid line of whiteness that stretched from the tree and meandered away toward the distant castle gate. He climbed until his feet were level with the top of the clouds, paused for a moment to revel in the strong, swift beating of his heart, then stepped off the branch. For a sickening instant the whiteness gave, but only a little. He windmilled his arms for balance, then discovered that it was no worse than standing on a mattress. He began to walk. The castle grew larger as he approached. If Paul had retained any doubts that he was in a story and not a real place, the ever clearer view of his destination would have dispelled them. It was clearly something that someone had made up. It was real, of course, and quite solid, although... What did that mean to a man walking across the clouds? But it was real in the way of things long believed in but never seen. It had the shape of a castle. It was as much a castle as something could ever be. But it was no more a medieval fortress than it was a chair or a glass of beer. It was an idea of a castle, Paul realized. A sort of platonic ideal unrelated to the grubby realities of Mott and Bailey architecture, or feudal warfare. Platonic ideal? He had no idea where that had come from. Memories were swimming just below the surface of his conscious mind, closer than ever, but still as strangely unfocused as the many-towered vision before him. 
He walked on beneath the unmoving sun, wisps of cloud rising from his heels like smoke. The gate was open but did not seem welcoming. For all the diffuse glimmer of the towers, the entranceway itself was deep, black, and empty. Paul stood before the looming hole for some time, his blood lively in his veins, his self-protective reflexes urging him to turn back, even though he knew he must enter. At last, feeling even more naked than he had beneath the hail of shellfire which had begun this whole mad dream, he took a breath and stepped through. The vast stone chamber beyond the door was curiously stark, the only decoration a single great banner, red embroidered. Let's chart that again. The vast stone chamber beyond the door was curiously stark, the only decoration a single great banner, red embroidered with black and gold, that hung on the far wall. It bore a vase or chalice out of which grew two twining roses, with a crown floating above the flowers. Below the picture was the legend, Ad Eternum. As he stepped forward to examine it, his footsteps reverberated through the empty chamber, so loud after the muffling cloud carpet that it startled him. He thought that someone would surely come to see who had entered, but the doors at either end of the chamber remained shut, and no other sound joined the dying echoes. It was hard to stare at the banner for long. Each individual thread of black and gold seemed to move so that the whole picture swam blurrily before his eyes. It was only when he stepped back, almost to the entrance, that he could see the picture clearly again, but it still told him nothing of this place or who might live here. Paul looked at the doors at either end. There seemed little to choose between them, so he turned toward the one on the left. Though it seemed only a score or so of paces away, it took him a surprisingly long time to reach it. Paul looked back. The far portal was now only a dark spot a great distance away, and the antechamber itself seemed to be filling with mist, as though clouds were beginning to drift in from outside. He turned, and found that the door he had sought now loomed before him. It swung open easily at his touch, so he stepped through, and found himself in a jungle. But it was not quite that, he realized a moment later. Vegetation grew thickly everywhere, but he could see shadowy walls through the looping vines and long leaves. Arched windows set high on those walls looked out on a sky busy with dark storm clouds, quite a different sky than the shield of pure blue he had left beyond the front gate. The jungle was everywhere, but he was still inside, even though the outside was not his own. This chamber was larger even than the huge front hall. Far, far above the nodding, poisonous-looking flowers and the riot of greenery stretched a ceiling covered with intricate, sharp-angled patterns, all of gleaming gold, like a jeweled map of a labyrinth. Another memory came drifting up, the spell and the warm, wet air tickling it free. This kind of place was called... was called... A conservatory, a place where things were kept, he dimly recalled, where things grew, where secrets were hidden. He stepped forward, pushing the sticky fronds of a long-leafed plant out of his path, then had to do a sudden dance to avoid tumbling into a pond that the plant had hidden. Dozens of tiny fish, red as pennies heated in a forge, darted away in alarm. He turned and moved along the edge of the pond, searching for a path. The plants were dusty. As he worked his way through the thickest tangles, powdery clouds rose up into the light, angling down through the high windows, swirling bits of floating silver and mica. He paused, waiting for the dust to settle. In the silence, a low sound drifted to him. Someone was weeping. He reached up with both hands and spread the leaves as though they were curtains. Framed in the twining vegetation stood a great bell-shaped cage, its slender golden bars so thickly wound with flowering vines it was hard to see what it contained. He moved closer, and something inside the cage moved. 
Paul stopped short. It was a woman. It was a bird. It was a woman. She turned, her wide black eyes wet. A great cloud of dark hair framed her long face and spilled down her back to merge with the purple and iridescent green of her strange costume. But it was no costume. She was clothed in feathers. Beneath her arms, long pinions lay folded like a paper fan. Wings. Who's there? she cried. It was all a dream, of course. Perhaps just the last hallucinatory moments of a battlefield casualty. But as her voice crept into him and settled itself, like something that had found its home, he knew that he would never forget the sound of it. There was determination and sorrow and the edge of madness all in those two words. He stepped forward. Her great round eyes went wider still. Who are you? You do not belong here. Paul stared at her, although he could not help feeling that he was doing her some insult, as though her feathered limbs were a sort of deformity. Perhaps they were, or, or perhaps in this strange place he was the deformed one. Are you a ghost? she asked. If so, I waste my breath, but you do not look like a ghost. I don't know what I am. Paul's dry mouth made it hard to speak. I don't know where I am either, but I don't feel like a ghost. You can talk. Her alarm was such that Paul feared he had done something dreadful. You do not belong here. Why are you crying? Can I help you? You must go away. You must. The old man will be back soon. Her agitated movements filled the air, with, filled the room with a soft rustling. More dust fluttered into the air. Who, who is this old man, and who are you? She moved to the edge of the cage, grasping the bars in her slender fingers. Go, go now. But her gaze was greedy, as though she wished to make him into a memory that would not fade. You are hurt. There's blood on your clothing. Paul looked down. Old blood. Who are you? She shook her head. No one? She paused, and her face moved as though she would say something shocking or dangerous, but the moment passed. I am no one. You must go before the old man returns. But what is this place? Where am I? All I have are questions and more questions. You should not be here. Only the ghosts visit me here, and the old man's evil instruments. He says they are to keep me company, but some of them have teeth and very unusual senses of humor. Butterball and nickel plate, they are the cruelest. Overwhelmed, Paul suddenly stepped forward and grasped her hand where it curled around the bars. Her skin was smooth, her skin was cool, and her face was very close. You are a prisoner. I will free you. She jerked her hand away. I cannot survive outside this cage. And you cannot survive if the old man finds you here. Have you come hunting the grail? You will not find it here. This is only a shadow place. Paul shook his head impatiently. I know nothing of any grail. But even as he spoke, he knew it was not the full truth. The word set up an echo deep inside him, touched parts that were still out of his reach. Grail. Something. It meant something. You do not understand, the bird woman said, and shining feathers ruffled and bunched around her neck as she grew angry. I am not one of the guardians. I have nothing to hide from you, and I would not see you... I would not see you harmed. Go, you fool! Even if you could take it, the old man would find you no matter where you went. He would hunt you down, even if you crossed the white ocean. Paul could feel the fear beating out from her, and for a moment he was overwhelmed, unable to speak or move. She was afraid for him. This prisoned angel 
felt something for him. And the grail, whatever it might be, he could feel the idea of it, swimming just beyond his grasp like one of the bright fish. A terrible hissing sound, loud as a thousand serpents, set the leaves around them swaying. The bird woman gasped and shrank back into the center of her cage. A moment later, a great clanging tread sounded through the trees, which shivered, stirring more dust. It's him! Her voice was a muffled shriek. He's back! Something huge was coming nearer, huffing and banging like a war engine. A harsh light flickered through the trees. Hide! The naked terror in her whisper set his heart hammering. He will suck the marrow from your bones! The noise was becoming louder. The walls themselves were quiver quivering, the ground pitching. Paul took a step, then stumbled and sank to his knees as terror fell on him like a black wave. He crawled into the thickest part of the undergrowth, leaves slapping against his face, smearing him with dust and damp. A loud creak sounded as of mighty hinges. Then the room was filled with the smell of an electrical storm. I am home! The old man's voice was loud as cannon fire and just as boomingly inhuman. And where is your song to greet me? And I'm going to stop there. Seemed like a good place to stop. Not that I like cliffhangers or anything. And that's not where the forward stops, but that's significantly well enough into it to leave us a little more tomorrow to finish up. And again, for those who don't know, those of you who don't want to be around for the actual live broadcast every time, um, these are available on YouTube and um, under under Chris Fab's name, F Fab spelled Fab like Fab Gear, like the Beatles, you know. Um, Chris Fab, C-H-R-I-S, Fab, on YouTube. They're also available, obviously, especially the recent ones are easy to find on um, my two Facebook pages or my Twitter feed. So you can, uh, if you don't want to stick around or if you can't be up in time, uh, if you can't be around in time for one of the broadcasts, that's that's what they're there for. Um, with that, I will say thank you so much, uh, all of you, for joining me. Sorry for the continuous weird, weird, weird um, things that are going on with this page. When I have a moment to deal with it, I will think about trying to either get some answers to this or move this whole thing to YouTube. Um, but as I said, in the moment, I'm in the middle of 70 zillion things. And every time I think I have time to work on something else, somebody throws some new thing on top of me. So enough, enough, enough. Who wants to, you don't want to hear my complaints. I don't want to hear my complaints. They bore me. So what I will concentrate on is my gratitude and pleasure. And that is what I get both of those things from getting a chance to hang out with all of you. So Thank you so much for joining me. Take good care of yourself and the others around you who need taking care of. And let's all of us take care of our fellow human beings and move forward. So that's it. I will be back at 7 p.m. Um, Sunday to finish up the foreword and maybe get a little bit into the South, Africa, South, South African part of the uh, next part of the book. And that's it, I guess. So... Good night. Peace. Be good.